I'm gonna need you to get it together. Like we've had all week to get it together. Yeah, I'm just not very good at getting it together or keeping it together. Um, I was saying I almost wore my red shirt today too. We could have been twinkies. So welcome to the consultation. And um, my name is Christina Jimenez. And you are. And this is also Mr. Floyd. Um, he is an attorney as well. Um, I've been practicing law now for 14 years. Floyd, you've been practicing for almost 10. And today, we are getting it together. Now, can I hear you? I don't know. Can you hear me? Nope. Oh, wait, because I'm on mute. Now. Hello. Ah, got you. All right. Where are we? Well, I was just introducing you and myself. And so, <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> what we do um, during the consultation is if you send a comment on Facebook Live, we will do our best to answer those questions as we receive them. We also have other questions that we have been asked in the past, and we kind of walk through those fact patterns. Um, we tell everyone that take this kind of with a grain of salt. It's general information for you to get a little bit of insight on different family law issues, um, for you to have some information about issues that may or may not be relevant to your situation, but you always have to take the time and the opportunity to go and seek out independent counsel, sit down and visit with an attorney and get um, your story out there and let that attorney tell you um, this is what we need to do in your particular situation, okay? And the hope is, is just that we're kind of getting some good stuff out here that will maybe eventually help some people in their family law cases. Um, we're just trying to spread a little good in this kind of ugly world sometimes. So, yeah. Boy, first question. Uh, first question. You have already read it, which is why I got the first question, I assume. <clears throat> Okay, warrant will expire. If oh, hi, Ashlyn. Hi, Bestie. Hi, <laughs> love you. Um, okay, so Ashlyn's my daughter, by the way, for those of you that don't know. Um, so warrant will expire if start pay child support. I went to overseas to take care of my parent, got sick, and stuck i could not come back also for the record that's misspelled which is why i was struggling with the word stuck um, <laughs> i missed my court day and i'm behind so much on child support after six months i finally came back to the states i got a job and we'll start to pay child support if i start to pay portion of my child support will my warrant expire okay so it doesn't I, thought I got to answer the question if you ask the question. <laughs> okay, Christina. <laughs> I guess this is a question that you want to answer. Go okay. ahead. Thank you, Floyd. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so no, your warrants will not expire. Um, the only way to get rid of that warrant is to be detained, to potentially do get a walkthrough, pay the bond. Um, and it gets really tricky when it comes to child support because a lot of times um, what happens is the court's going to, well, whenever they issue a capias because you didn't appear, typically what they're going to do is they're going to set that bond for either what you owe in support or like a really high amount. And typically, typically it's a cash bond, right, Floyd? Yes, and sometimes it's no bond. Yeah, yeah. And so... Um, I mean, I've seen some of these bonds at like 13000 16000 um, and you basically have to pay that to get out of what happens is they hold that money, and then once you get out of jail, they will release that money to the mother or the father um, as support, okay? Now, the code does require that when you're released because of a capias on a motion for enforcement, and I guess let me back up. I guess I'm, I'm kind of, don't act like you knew. Don't act like you knew. That you're presuming facts? Not okay. enough. Okay. 
Okay. So, well, wait, what do you think I'm presuming? That there was ever an enforcement filed? He says that he missed his court day. Mm -hmm. And he's behind so much on child support and they issued a warrant. So I think that I am safe in presuming that a motion for enforcement had been filed. And that basically is whenever you don't pay your support, they'll file a motion to put you in jail, right? And when they file that motion, they're also going to file what we call an order to appear. And in this order, it basically says, you need to show up on this day and at this time. And if you are served with those documents, and if you do not show up when you're supposed to, then the court at that time can issue a warrant for your arrest. And they will set a bond. And when they set the bond, um, you have to get arrested, clear that bond, and then you can kind of go on and start dealing with your child support issues. Now, the code does require that if you're picked up on a warrant on a, a, a failure to appear, isn't it 72 hours, Floyd, three days, or as soon as reasonably practical or something like that? Yeah, to set a bond. Yeah, to, to, to appear before the court so that they can address that issue and potentially allow you to potentially pay a lesser amount or to let you get out or to potentially sentence you. Um, so your warrant's not going to expire and you're going to have to unfortunately deal with it. And so it is very important that if ever you are served with an order to appear, that you do show up when you're supposed to. Um, and kind of a side note is if you are facing contempt charges, that's what we call a quasi-criminal proceeding, okay? And so if you do not have the ability to hire an attorney, you can request that the court appoint you an attorney. Um, you have to file what we call an affidavit of indigency where you basically say, hey judge, this is how much money I make. I don't have money to hire an attorney. And then the court could potentially appoint an attorney to help kind of walk me through those issues. And you most certainly need to um, take advantage of that. Because if not, I mean, you can go to jail for up to six months on these things. And I guess technically it can be longer, but the standard is six months. So there's also the possibility of the um, criminal amount of support, right? It being a criminal which I think in this case, you're probably right, is probably just a civil warrant. Mm -hmm. But there could be a criminal amount of support where you'd be facing, I think it's a state jail felony. Um, but I, have you ever seen that charge? I've never seen it charged. I haven't either, but I know it's a thing. So, um. Now, everybody, all the police departments are going to hate us because we're getting a bunch of phone calls like, I wouldn't be charged with criminal amount of support. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so motion for new trial on a divorce. What's next? Ex-husband wants a new trial and it was granted. He thinks he put in more money than I did on the house. Yet the first year and a half we lived at our home, he was incarcerated. So I was paying the mortgage and even got a loan to pay off property taxes we owed. I left because I knew he had someone else and yes, he had a child with a mutual friend. He thinks it's separate property, but we bought the house while engaged. He feels he should get more than 50% of the property. Oh, <laughs> good yeah, this is a good one. Okay. Um, so first, I'll just answer the what's next, right? So once the new trial is granted. Wait, what's the new trial, Mr. Floyd? Uh, so it's... Um, not an old one, but a new one. No. So after after there's been a judgment rendered, a final order, you have 30 days to file a motion for a new trial. There's various grounds under which you could file one. I, I don't really understand his basis. Maybe a disproportionate division, not the correct finding, something like that. But whatever the case may be, there's various reasons why you can file a motion for a new trial. And so once the motion for a new trial is granted, if it's granted, then it basically it starts everything over again from scratch, uh, and you go back through it. So that's what's next. Um, as far as the house being separate property, that's my gut's telling me that's the reason new trial was granted um, because the court wouldn't have the authority to divide that if it was in fact separate property. Um, 
They both bought the house while engaged. I'm going to assume it's in both of their names. Um, but it's still separate property. So just putting property in both your names doesn't make it community. It's uh, you have your joint owner owners of it. So you each own 50% of it as separate property. And yeah, so the court can't divide it. Uh, you're going to have to file a separate civil proceeding and have it divided out that way. I guess that's the only reason I would understand the argument of paying the mortgage. Are you, you okay? are you okay today? Uh, perfect. Are you? I, I feel like you're a little like all over the place. No? I, no, I thought I was right on. Did you think I said something incorrectly? I don't know. You just seem a little bit like scattered today. Well, uh, that question. So I was thinking through it, right? Because for the purposes of this case, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it kind of does. The mortgage that was paid because the community may have a reimbursement. Like, it's a really complex. And I was trying to figure out how much to get into because I could go on for an hour with this one question. Um, yeah, yeah, I get it. But you said something that the court wouldn't necessarily have the authority to divide the property. Um, but the court has the authority to confirm the house as each party's 50% ownership of separate property, right? Right. But the court can't make any party sell it because the court doesn't have the legal authority to divest you of your separate property. So separate property is property that is owned prior to the marriage if it's gifted to you or if it's inherited during the marriage. Okay. And so in this case, because they're saying that they bought it while they were engaged, it would be 50% separate property to now wife and 50% separate property to now husband. And so um, the court at the final divorce proceeding couldn't say, okay, well, I'm going to give this entire house to husband or I'm going to give this entire house to wife because they can't do that if it's your separate property. And so what Floyd was saying is, is you have to file like a, a, se a separate civil proceeding. It's like if you had a partner um, and you and your partner had purchased a home together, it's the same concept. You have to go to civil court and ask the court to then force a sale or a buyout or something of that nature. Um, and so as far as the new trial is concerned, I think that that's sometimes incredibly frustrating for people. So all of your, your pleadings and everything that happened, even like your temporary orders, all of that still stays in place if a new trial is granted. But you may think that you were divorced, right? And then the motion for new trial is filed and then it's granted. And if you pur purchased anything after you thought you were divorced, now it gets to come back into the community and that really potentially sucks because it would be subject, subject to division. I understand what you're going to say. Well, the judge might not disclose, give it, and they can use discretion. I understand that. But technically, it's community property. Um, and so motions for new trial are a pain. And I don't know that the, if the award of separate property was the issue, like why it was granted, but that whole process is just going to suck. So, um, well, so, so in this case, she was, she's talking about he, she paid more of the house than he did because he was in prison or whatever. In the divorce case, none of that's relevant, right? A except for if she's claiming, I mean, the Q community would have a, a reimbursement claim, uh, but I don't know if they have other property or not, but where do they get it if they have a reimbursement claim? Anyway, it could get really, really complicated. Hi, Nancy. Um, she said, hey to me. Nobody said, hey to you. I know. Everybody's saying, oh, wait, Ashlyn did say hi to me. So I'll take it. Um, okay. Next question. Is it your turn to ask or mine? It's my turn to ask. Okay, go. Which one do I want to go with? Um, we're going in order, Floyd. Okay. How do I get grandparent rights? Oh, good. <laughs> 
my son's baby mama mama okay my son's baby mama does not let me see my granddaughter it's going going on a year since i've seen her i've messaged her to talk to my granddaughter and she doesn't respond to my messages at all last time i asked her if i could pick her up she said no she never had a problem before now that my son got out of prison after doing two years is when she started not to let me see or talk to my granddaughter. <clears throat> okay. I immediately regret my decision. Nancy said hi to you as a sympathetic hi. Hi, Nancy. <laughs> um, okay, so grandparents' rights are so, so frustrating. So frustrating. And I hate this for grandparents. I understand it, but I hate it. Um, so as parents, we have constitutional protections to raise our children the best way that we see fit, right? And in order to get past that constitutional right, the Texas legislature has placed a very, very high burden on grandparents to be able to come in and fight for visitation. And so basically what a grandparent has to do is a grandparent has to prove to the court that if the court does not permit the grandparent to see the child, that that child is going to suffer some sort of emotional or physical or psychological harm, right? And so the question then becomes, how in the world do you prove that, right? So if my grandbaby doesn't get to see me, how is it going to hurt her, right, or him? Um, it's an incredibly high burden. And it's one of those where really in very limited circumstances, if I kind of thought I might have a shot at getting possession and access, right? So I think it's important that we... I. I I make the or differentiate between fighting for custody of a grandchild and fighting for visitation, okay? This lady's talking about just visitation. Um, in order to get visitation, that's what she's going to have to prove. And the only times that I've really felt confident about one of those cases was when I had a grandchild who had basically been raised by a grandparent and then the parent, for whatever reason, you know, unilaterally yanked that kiddo away from the grandparent. And basically our argument was, there's no way that this isn't difficult for this kiddo. I honestly don't know that we really met our burden, but we were able to glean some sort of sympathy from the court and we ended up getting visitation in that case. Um, but it's, it's pretty difficult. What's your... I, yeah, yeah, I agree. It's, I mean, we've handled a few of these cases and they're always, always difficult. Um, in this case, I'm, it doesn't say that there's an order, right? But I mean, if there is an order for dad to have visitation, then even if she can prove significant impairment, she can't, she can't get it because her son has visitation, right? Um, well, no, if, if she can prove significant impairment against both parents mm, for, I don't think conservatorship, so. for conservatorship right for possession and access i think that if the child the her child which would be the dad in this case mm -hmm. if he has the right to possession and access then she can't get it right right, right. um and i think if she had filed maybe while he was in prison she would have had a better chance um and if there's no order, I mean, to me, it's an easy resolution, right? If if there is an order, then he can designate her to pick up and drop off and all that stuff. If there's not an order, have him go get an order, right? So that he has visitation and then she can, if not exercise that visitation, certainly see the baby and talk to the baby during those periods of possession. That's going to be a heck of a lot easier than trying to fight for grandparent rights. And that, that is typically in these types of cases what we, we do, right? It's easier to represent the parent. And although 
clearly her son may have had some issues because he just got out of prison. <clears throat> it, you know, what I would probably tell this person if they came in for a consultation is I would say, let's see if we can represent your son and perhaps have you as the supervisor of the visits, right? Because the court might have concerns because he just got out of prison and that will give you some access to your granddaughter so that you all can start developing a relationship with her. So, um, but I probably, I mean, we don't have any dirt on mom other than she's denying visitation. I probably wouldn't proceed with any sort of the grandparents right in this case. So, it's been, yeah. it's been a year since she's seen her, right? I'm proving a significant impairment when the child has gone a year. I had a, very, a case very similar to this, and it was a, we were able to get some very minimal possession at mediation, but it was an uphill battle all the way. And very, well, very. <laughs> excuse me. On that one case that I had, it was, or not the one, but one of the cases I had, um, it was actually a grandmother who had custody of the kiddo and we were representing it. That was the, I think the paternal grandmother and we were representing the maternal grandmother. And in that case, we were able to find some case law to say that that constitutional protection, right, that high burden of proving that the kiddo is in, in danger, that doesn't apply if it's not a parent, because that's only to protect the parent. And so in that case, we were able to get him lots of visitation, and that was actually, you know, really, really good. Um, but for sure, if you're a grandparent and you're having these types of issues, we need to hire somebody and talk to them about those little nuances because you can potentially develop a strategy, right? So when it comes to visitation, it's difficult. When it comes to getting conservatorship, it's also difficult. But you could, if the child's in danger, if you can prove what we call significant impairment, then you have a chance of potentially getting custody. Um, but that's a, a whole other question, a whole other yeah, I, I just, I think the big distinction between those two, right, is for conservatorship, you've got to show that the child is in danger, right? For possession and access, you got to show that the, if the child does not have possession and access, or the grandparent does not have possession and access to the child, the child will suffer. How do you prove that? It's, it's that's the complicated part, right? Um, the last grandparent case that um, I had, you can get a temporary order for counseling, right? Um, even if you can't establish it at that point, but it's just, and it's, it's standing, it's a threshold issue. So you can get kicked out before you can even get in the door. It's, they're fun, they're fun. Yeah, I can tell by your head scratching. <laughs> Very frustrating for some grandparents that are really just trying to be there. I know, I know. Um, okay, so my turn to read. Um, yes, it is. Okay. Texas, can I get out of paying child support if the custodial parent allows someone else, not me, to claim job as a dependent? Um, the custodial parent has been allowing their grandmother to claim our child as a dependent on taxes for many years. They both lived with this grandmother for almost their entire life with my child. Since this child was 16 years old, the custodial parent moved out and left the child with the grandmother. The child is now 18 and lives with me, but I still have past due child support debt. In my eyes, when this individual started allowing someone else to claim the child as a dependent and not allowing me, they legally stated that someone else is supporting the child over 50% of the time. Surely there should be a course of action I can take with the situation. How can I use this or anything else to, at a minimum, lessen my past due child support, if not eliminate it? Poor guy. Uh, so unfortunately, there's nothing you can do. Um, you can't retroactively modify support. I mean, hindsight's 2020, but you should have hired somebody when she was a lot younger. Um, I, I don't really know. I mean, I don't do tax stuff, but I don't think that grandmother claiming the child as a dependent would impact anything that the court did, um, it certainly wouldn't reduce child support. I mean, he couldn't be obligated to pay grandmother child support unless grandmother was a party of some sort. So yeah, I mean, I think that he would still have to pay child support. Um, 
yeah, she's 18 now, so I, presuming she's graduated high school, his obligations ended, right? So, nada, nothing you could do? Then was when the kiddo was 16, should have gone in and taken custody. Why 16? The child was 16, the custodial parent moved out and left the child with the grandmother. Oh, okay, yeah, I, I thought she moved out with the child, but yes, left the child with grandmother. So I, I've, I've heard the argument, and, and I guess I had it argued that once against me that the parent has the right to designate the primary residence. doesn't say the child has to live with the parent, right? And they can designate that residence to be with grandmother. Um, and so... How'd you like that argument, Floyd? Um, I mean, it, it sucked when it was used against me. Um, but I don't even remember what case or how the outcome was, but I'm sure I won because I won all my cases, but, um, so then it would be a best interest argument, right? Is it best for mom to continue to be able to designate and designate that as grandmothers or is it the best interest of the child for dad to then have the right to designate and the child will live with dad? But I mean, worst case scenario, you not worst case, but the possibility you file when, he, when she's 16 and say, okay, I'll let her stay there, but give her the child support or something like that, right? So anyways, nothing you can do now. But, but here's the thing, like this claiming the child as a dependent, it is something that comes up all the time when I'm negotiating cases. And it's a, a big question, so we'll just go ahead and cover it. Um, so the IRS code basically says that, at least this is my understanding, I've never actually read it, um, but my understanding of it is, is whoever um, the child lives with for 50% or 51% or more of the time, that is the person who has the legal right pursuant to that code to claim the child as a dependent, okay? Now, <laughs> the parent that- hey, what did you just say? That the parent who the child is living with for 51% or more of the time is the parent who gets to claim the child as a dependent. Okay. That, that's by the, the tax code, the federal tax code, right? That's what I, yeah, that's what I meant. And so you do have the ability to, I guess, negotiate that or barter that, right? And sometimes we do it in our final orders where we'll say, okay, father in odd years will claim the children and even years mother will claim the children or, you know, each party's going to claim one child and there's a, a special form that you guys have to sign in order to convey, I guess, that right um, to the other parent, okay? So you can, I guess, put that in your decrees and put that in your order. I've never had the issue of somebody trying to back out of that and say, no, we're going to, you know, default to the, the tax code. I don't, I mean, I've never had it come up. I would presume that if it's in your final decree or in your final order, that they're going to be expected to comply with it because that now, you now fall, fall under the jurisdiction of the state of Texas. Um, but so with that being said, if the child is living with mom, I don't care if you're paying $2,300 a month in child support, mom's going to be able to claim the child as a dependent unless you put it in your order. And it says that you get to claim the child as a dependent. So my understanding of if you do come up to an agreement and you agree to alternate years or whatever, that because we're dealing with, with federal versus state courts, right? And federal trumps state and state courts can't tell the federal court what to do. They can't modify the federal codes, right? And so the IRS doesn't have to and won't honor that, right? I think your remedy then is an enforcement for their, their failure to follow the court order, but there's nothing you can do to force the IRS to remove mom from claiming the child and allowing you to claim the child. Yeah. And I mean, way, way, way back in the day when all this stuff started and when I was just starting, there was a couple of times where we tried to litigate that issue. And in both cases, the judges said, I don't have jurisdiction over this. There's nothing that I can do. And so 
Um, now we just try to negotiate. Maybe we offer some property, we offer additional support, we offer something to try to get that ability if it's that important to our client. But if they won't agree, then you're just stuck. So, so I don't think it's been addressed yet. And say I don't do taxes, so if it has, I don't know it. But Texas particularly is moving more and more towards a 50-50 possession state, particularly with the new addition to the under 50 miles provision. Um, and I know they've been trying to get there for a while and haven't quite got there, but I'm curious what the IRS code does with that once it becomes 50-50, because then there's no primary parent. I mean, typically when we do, when we agree to a 50-50 possession or if a judge orders it, the judge can't order <coughs> how the taxes will be done, right? But then we alternate years, right? Um, because there is no primary parent. But curious what the IRS does with that once we do get to a 50-50 state and how they're going to treat that. First to file, I guess? I don't know. That's going to be a madhouse. Well, and that brings up another issue that I see a lot from a lot of phone calls that I get in tax season is, you know, mom shows up to file her returns and she's claiming the kiddos on, on tax returns. And um, when the, they're trying to process it, it kicks back and says, hey, these kiddos have already been claimed by presumably father, right? Um, and obviously chaos at that point ensues. And so kind of the work around that is um, you can't file an electronic return. You have to file a paper return, which sucks because it takes a lot longer to process, right? But you file with mom, you file your paper return, then it gets kicked into, over to the IRS and it's going to get a red flag, which that means that dad potentially screwed up for both of you guys because now the IRS is looking at your stuff and, you know, that's never fun. And so um, what will happen... I don't personally is that, have a problem with the IRS looking at my stuff for the record. Yeah, me neither. Me neither. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, but what will happen at that point is the IRS is going to want to see a court order or documentation or something to prove which parent actually has that right, right? And then what'll happen is the right to designate the residence and who's had the kiddo for more than 50% of the time. And let's say, hypothetically speaking, that dad had received a $10,000 uh, return because he claimed all these kiddos and then the IRS determines, well, you shouldn't have claimed the kids. Now they're gonna garnish or they're gonna go after their 10,000 from dad and then mom will be able to claim the children and it's just a mess, so. Don't do that if you don't, if the kids are not living with you and if you don't have permission, because it's, and then everybody's just delayed in getting their money and the kids suffer and why? Yeah, don't do it. So, um, my turn for the question. Uh, I, I think you just asked that question to me. Good so now I get to ask you a question. Okay. Oh, really? You can go to the next one because that one's kind of easy. Uh, well, I think you should still answer it. You'll answer it quickly. So, car uh, does my husband have signed title for me to sell a car? Car was purchased by both of us and in both of our names. I was awarded the divorce. Now she wants. Now they want to sell it. Does he have to sign it? Now I want to sell it. Does he have to sign the title in order for me to sell it? Um. So, I say it was easy. Uh, typically what we do is we do a power of attorney to transfer with the vehicle uh, whenever we're closing out our divorce decrees. And so if wife is awarded a car, husband will sign a power of attorney to transfer the motor vehicle. Wife will have those in her records. And then when she goes to trade it in or sell it or do whatever, um, that's going to be the document that kind of gives her that legal right or that title to be able to do that. Um, and so... No, he doesn't have to sign the title. If he signs that, then that's fine. If you have the title, if it's already paid off, then you probably want to put that in the decree that he has to sign that title, but I don't think it's necessary. Well, so, so if there's not a power of attorney, then yes, it's necessary. Yes, it's necessary. That's what I meant to say. Right. Okay. So I'll go to the next question for you. In a joint conservatorship, if only one parent needs daycare during the, their custody period, can they force the other parent to pay half? Mm, this comes up. All right, so they have a joint managing conservatorship. I like their use of the legal terminology. We don't see that a lot in these questions, but X needs after school care during their custody period, but I do not and will not use it during my custody period. 
X says I must still pay half. Decree states it is ordered that each party shall pay, I'm assuming is there, 50% of all after school and or daycare tuition fees. Has no language about mutually agreeing to the daycare, but uh, does the duty of care during the custody period override this? <laughs> so this is why it is so important that we are paying attention to the fine print and we are thinking of all of the worst possible scenarios. And I always say that I'm a paranoid patty, right? Because I'm always, when I'm looking at this language, I'm always thinking like, how is this going to potentially screw my client over, right? Is this going to be a disaster if I put this provision in? Um, and, you know, thankfully, you know, we've been doing it long enough and we both have so many cases really, and our other attorneys that work with us have had so many cases where we can kind of come together and we learn from these types of mistakes, right? So that we're not making them anymore. Um, but that was just bad drafting on the behalf of that lawyer. Um, because yes, you're on the hook. If you need it or not, that order says it is ordered that each party shall pay 50% of all after school and or daycare tuition fees. And so if that is a fee that they are incurring monthly, whether or not you need it, you're on the hook for it. And I don't know that you even get a modification on it. Like if you go back to court and say, judge, I don't need this after school care and I don't want to have to pay for it. The judge may say, well, you shouldn't have put it in your original order to begin with. That was part of the deal, right? I, I, I mean, I guess it I guess it depends, right? I mean, if this order was entered into when they were two and the child was going to daycare and they were splitting that, now the child's eight, right? And only using after school care. Yeah, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. So if ever, and, and we see this a lot when parents are doing 50-50 possession, right? And, and that's kind of the, the problem with it is presumptively mom may have agreed to give you 50% of the time and may have waived child support in exchange for you covering 50% of the daycare expense. And so then it kind of becomes this issue of, is it now fair to go back and complain about it? And will the court allow you to do that? So, um, I say you should have put in this order that as mutually agreed upon, you know, or so long as that parent is utilizing the daycare and or after school care. Um, but otherwise, I think you need to pay. I will say again, going to the kind of technicalities of this language, I don't know that that's enforceable, right? As support, it doesn't have a, a date, place, manner. Yeah. So in order for somebody to be held in contempt of court for not doing something, um, the code is very, very specific, right? Because if, if they can put you in jail, then you have to know what your obligation is, right? And so in this particular case, what I would have wanted to see that is something to the effect of it is worth that each parent shall pay on November 1st, 2021, and the first day of each month thereafter, one half of the tuition fees, if you have the amount, put the amount in directly to name of the daycare facility. Um, and maybe at that point you can get a contempt charge. I don't think he goes to jail. I think the court clarifies it and then he has to pay for it though. Yeah, or you could do it and track the unreimbursed language, right? So once they incur the expense, they send it to the other party. That party has 30 days to reimburse the party. But the, another problem with this language is he could pick any school, right? He could pick a school that's $5,000 a month, and you're paying half of it. It's that, this language is very, very crazy. If you have this, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hey. This is, we're like Debbie Downers today. Like everything we're like yeah. this. Uh, All these questions are like, no, nope, sorry. I promise there are something <laughs> went on, just not today, I guess. Oh my gosh. Um, okay, so my son wants his name removed from our house. 
when my wife and I purchased this house, we added our son's names to try and help them with their credit. Now my son is trying to purchase his own house and it is holding up the purchase. How can we remove his name quickly? It's not really a family law question, um, but he could just sign the deed over to them and... Negative, Ghost Rider. What okay. Because the reason why it's holding up the son's purchase is because of his debt to equity ratio. So it's an issue with the note um, of the mortgage. And so they're going to have to go in and they're going to have to refinance that home to get the son off the note so that he can then go and purchase his new home. Yeah, if it's the, the mortgage, uh, yeah, I didn't see anything about a mortgage, but I, I see your logical walk through there. Um, Why? Are, I, this is like the third question or second question that we've seen like this, where people are putting their kids on their notes to build up their credit. I mean, maybe I'm just like a bad parent because I'm like not worried about my kid's credit. Just like, you'll figure it out. I figured it out. Well, I, I put my son on my credit card. Did you really? Yeah. Kason's rolling around with the black Mason or what? No, my 16 year old, Caleb. Okay. <laughs> well, you're a good dad. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, but putting him on a house note, that's... No. Don't love him that much. Yeah, I just think that that's, it. it's just different to me. I never thought about it. I guess it might be smart. I just don't know enough about that. Yeah. If but, you do that, can you go after them for one third of the payment? Maybe, maybe. So, um, but yeah, I, that's the problem. So they're going to have to go through a refinance of this residence. So it's an important distinction, and people always kind of get this confused, but when you're dealing with property, there's basically two issues, right? So your first issue is your contract with the bank. That's your note, okay? And so whoever signs that contract, you guys are on the hook for that note, okay? And I don't care if in the divorce, they say that this house is awarded to wife, if you're on that note and you don't resolve that in your divorce, you're going to have problems, right? So you, you have to put in refinance provisions or sell provisions when you're, you're in, in what we call a deed of trust to secure assumption in your final decree of divorce, because we've seen this so many times where they basically say, okay, house is going to go to wife, and then dad has to or husband has to sign the deed to transfer the house to wife but then um there's nothing about the note and so then fast forward two years later husband wants to go and buy a new house with his new wife and he can't because he still has a two hundred thousand dollar note on his ex-wife's house and he's like hey i need to sell this or i need to get my new home and i can't and i don't know that there's anything that you can do about that at that point so I, I don't know, I don't know exactly what the banks and stuff would look at, but if you were to, like if in this case, if son, sorry, if husband wife were to sign a deed of trust to, to secure assumption, relieving son of that obligation, would that help with his, would they still going to look at it as that's your obligation? Yeah. 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 Sucks. Yeah. Tell your son to pony up, pay the house off. Yeah, I mean, and it's, it should hopefully be simple enough. If they only did it for his credit and he wasn't actually contributing, then I think a refinance would probably be easier. You're going to take a little bit of time and pay a little bit of money, but I think you'll get it done and it'll be fine. Um, and nowadays you can get those refis done fairly quickly, um, but that's what they're going to have to do. Well, and depending on how long they've had the house, right, and how much equity they have, because the problem I've run into is when people want to refi, right, you can only refi for 80% of the value. Is that going to be enough to pay off the other note? Uh, but it sounds like they've had it a while, you know. I'm going to go with they've had it for about seven years. So they should have some equity. Okay. All righty. My turn to ask the question? Sure. Um, oh, shit. No. Sorry. 
Okay. Is it my turn or is it your turn? Go ahead. Language. Ashlyn, I'm sorry. Ashlyn, daddy said a no no word there. Lord. Um, okay. Is it my turn or is it your turn? We need somebody that's like feeding this through and doing the bleep thing. Yeah, yeah. We need to be delayed about 20 seconds for your potty mouth. Um, uh, go ahead and ask the question. I'll but I thought we already did this one. We had a question like this a few weeks ago. No? We can ask it again. So, can I, 18, take legal guardianship of my little brother, who is eight? who doesn't want to live with his dad. Hello, I'm here on behalf of my younger sibling, who is eight years old, who isn't happy living with his dad, who I believe doesn't understand the person he is. Do we have this? No. I'm 18 with full-time job as a salesman. I'm also graduating high school, going to attend a four-year college, in hopes to pursue my own degree in law. However, let me explain more in depth. I myself had to mature at a young age due to parental complications, and I know how he feels. My little brother has told me that he wishes to, he could live just with me because of how much he dreads living with his father. I've tried to get my mother back on track numerous times, but it doesn't seem to work. I'm wondering if I can legally take custody of my younger brother, if I can prove that I can supply his needs, as well as a happy and healthy household. Please respond. I've been up many nights thinking about what to do to get him out of this poor situation. Okay, so, I um, mean, the the burden is going to be the same as a grandparent, right? I mean, you're going to have to show that the child's in danger. It sounds like there won't be an issue with mom because mom's off track, but I'm curious to know what, what dad's doing to make it so miserable for the poor little guy. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's the same standards. It got to prove significant impairment. So if you can do that, you can do it. I mean, that sound I, legal advice, please. Well, I mean, we already explained the burden. Um, we can go back through it, but the exact same answer we gave for grandparents, now apply it to this. Ex just rewind and listen to that answer and then come back. Right. Okay. okay. And, then, and then listen to the last part where we distinguish between possession access and conservatorship because this one is for conservatorship. So in this one, you'll have to show that the child's circumstances as they are now are a danger to him. So and then, good. it is though this idea of an eight-year-old who isn't happy living with his dad. I mean, he doesn't say dad's hitting him, dad's abusing him, dad's starving him, dad's doing any of that, right? And so just because a kiddo may not be happy living with a parent doesn't mean that you win, right? The burden is way, way, way higher than... Well, as a matter of fact, it means you're going to lose if that's the only reason. Yeah, yeah. And so while I do think it's admirable what this kid is doing um, and thinking about... Uh, there, he's going to have to develop this a lot more. Um, and so, you know, typically when I have parents or siblings or grandparents or whoever, that when they come to us and they say, like, I just know that there's something wrong. Like, I just feel it in my gut, right? I know he's not happy. Um, and I get that because I'm a mom. I, you know, know those things to my own kiddos. Um, but it's one thing to know it and it's another thing to prove it, right? And so what I would want to know is, do you have any ability to get him into any sort of therapy? Do you have any, you know, were there any social media posts that he's made, any outcries that he's made to friends, any um, things that he's told you, right? Like, I'm going to run away, I'm going to hurt myself, that type of stuff. That's when you start getting to being able to prove that burden of significant impairment. Because, you know, sometimes when kids aren't happy, those are the things that kind of run through their, their mind. And if those things are going on, then he obviously is emotionally impaired and it needs to be addressed. Um, I don't, I'm not worried about the age of the kid or the fact that, you know, he's still in high school. 
um, I, I think at, he's considered an adult. He has the ability to be able to fight for custody so long as he can prove that his little brother's actually in danger, which based on the question, I don't know that he can. So I, I think where the, the age may come in, and I'm just going to add a bunch of facts here, but so if he can prove that the child is present circumstances are a danger to him, then dad's brother, dad's sister, dad's whatever could intervene. And then we're looking at a best interest standard, right? And what will the court think about that, right? I mean, you're 18, you're about to go to a four year college and try to take care of an eight year old versus dad's brother, dad's sister, whatever, who's established with a family and can better care for him. If I represented dad and I, I was afraid they would be able to prove that, that's what I would do. I would have family come in and intervene. And... Well, and it's interesting. I can't tell from the question, but he says, I had to mature at a young age due to parental complication and I know how it feels. I wonder if, I, I'm assuming that it's a different father because he says with his dad instead of our dad. And, but I wonder if he had any personal experiences with this gentleman, with the father in the situation, that he could then relate to the court to say, this is what he did to me. And although I may not have seen it, I surmise based on, you know, things that my brother told me that maybe it's happening to him. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, he needs to go and he needs to visit with an attorney and kind of flush out all the facts. Because um, he might have a chance. Maybe. Depends. You're saying there's a chance. Um, okay, so I guess my turn to read, but I don't know that this is a family law question. Yeah, go to the next one. Okay. In Texas, if a temporary restraining order is granted, what happens next at final trial? In Texas, if a temporary restraining order is granted, mother has primary, so I presume it means temporary order then. Um, father has standard possession every week. Okay. What happens next at final trial 60 days from now? What does the judge expect to see? What will happen at final trial? I asked the question, you answer it. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> so, I feel like in order to give this question some context, we kind of have to explain the process of a, what, child custody, an original SAPSER maybe, suit affecting their couple relationship. So, sure. the way that it goes down is a parent, let's just say in this particular case, mom. Mom files an original petition in suit affecting parent child relationship to establish rights, conservatorship rights, visitation, child support. Okay. And when she files that, typically what will happen is one of two things either a temporary restraining order is going to be signed by a judge or a um, standing order will already be issued, depending on the county that you're living in. Okay. And so when that happens, dad gets served and then dad has to show up for a hearing on the day and time that it says in that document that he's given, okay? That's your first hearing. That's what we call a temporary orders hearing, okay? Your attorney should be treating your temporary orders hearing the same way that they treat a final trial because it is just as important, if not more important in my opinion than your final trial because that's what's setting you up for success in the future, right? Typically, what happens at the temporary is going to stay the same at final unless there's something crazy that happens in between that. Okay, so you go in, um, you present all this evidence, and at the conclusion of that temporary hearing, the judge is going to say, "Okay, in this case, mom got primary, dad has standard visitation." Okay, and then presumptively in 60 days, it's probably a divorce. Now that I'm thinking about it, so put the 60 days in there. Um, in 60 days. Sometimes, I don't know what court he's in, but it typically doesn't take 60 days. It takes like months before you get in for your final trial. When you go in for your final trial, it is basically everything that you presented at your temporary hearing, plus 
a bunch of extra stuff, right? Like anything that's happened since then. You typically get a lot more time at your final trial to present evidence. And that's the big difference, right? Most courts, like if you're over in Collin County, you get 20 minutes aside to present your case. That means you get 20 minutes to explain to this judge why you should have primary custody and why the other parents should just have visitation or no visitation or whatever, right? At temporary. At temporary, yes. Um, and you, over in West Texas, we get 30 minutes to 45 minutes. But I mean, you're talking, you're flying to get all this information out to try to, to convince this court that you, you're the, the parent that should have these rights, right? When you go to a final trial, your attorney can typically request whatever amount of time they want, a day, two days, half a day, whatever it is, right? Um, so you have the ability to present more information, which could potentially change the court's mind. Um, but, I, I mean, we don't know what this father wants. I mean, if he wants primary custody, there's lots of things that he should be doing in the interim, right? If he's okay with standard visitation, with this exercise of visitation, um, you know, if everybody's kind of just doing the same thing and there's no big change, well, probably at the final trial, he's going to get standard visitation and that's going to be it, right? Yeah, so, I mean, I was confused because it's standard possession every week, so I don't know if he's talking about, like, a week on, week off, uh, but <laughs> at least in my experience, most of the time, particularly if it was a contested temporary, right, then the judge doesn't want to rehear what they heard, right, uh, and, and I guess if it was agreed to, right, because it's at that point you agreed to it, so most judges will say pick it up from temporary, Right. And what's happened since the temporary orders? How have they been working? How's the child been doing? So as far as what the judge will expect to see, and if you want to change something, then, I mean, you need to look at, I don't know how the kid is, but, you know, grades and, you know, extracurricular activities. And if the child's been going to counseling, you know, any issues the child's having, issues with visitation, you know, failure to pay child support. Basically, what's happened since that court order that helps your case? That's what judge wants to see at final. So. And it's important to know that you can always request, obviously, and fight for something different than what you fought for at the temporary and potentially get something different, right? And so, you know, just because you won at a temporary doesn't mean you're going to win at a final. You have the opportunity to, to screw that up. And so make sure you're minding your P's and Q's because um, judges don't like it when you misbehave. So... Um, Do you know what that means, minding P's and Q's? Are you Googling? I am. Okay. I, I don't know where my Google is. I have too many things up here. No, I don't know. Google doesn't know either, Clay. No, so it just says Pints and Courts. Finding your pints and quarts. Yeah. I don't know. We digress. That wasn't one of the questions. Well, we'll figure it out. That, that's a cliffhanger. We'll let everyone know next time. <laughs> you want to know what that means. <laughs> Come back next week. Um, all right. So at the conclusion of every single one of our um, meetings here, we always publish this, it's a disclaimer, basically same thing that I said when we started. Um, don't take this as legal advice, it's more general information. Um, go out, find yourself a good lawyer, somebody that you trust, somebody that you are comfortable with and ask them these questions um, and tell them your situation and they will hopefully lead you down the right path. Um, and with that, Mr. Floyd, I shall see you in a bit, unfortunately.